They're the feral mob outside. <laughs> who I've no doubt have all got 20 bucks in their back pocket, paid for by one George Soros. I said George Soros. Good, you're warming up. This is good, this is great. Well, we've been on the road all week. As Damien said, we started off in Perth, been all over Australia, and it's a bit like when I get roast pork. I put the crackling on the side of the plate because you save the best till last, and you're the best. Yeah. Now, I've never been to Melbourne before. I've wanted the last two times the England cricket team have been on tour with the Ashes here, and I've wanted to come on Boxing Day for your famous MCG test match. The trouble is, after both the first tests, I could see that we were going to lose five love. <laughs> And I wasn't going to come all this way to see my country humiliated by this wonderful, dominant, fantastic Australian cricket team who played so fairly and straightly over the years. <laughs> <laughs> if any of you are cheesed off with that, have a go at Steve Smith, not me, all right? <laughs> so I'm really happy to be here. It's been a great week. Uh, I found in this country people are friendly, they are nice, you've got great service, you've got an amazing place that you live. And one of my key messages that I bring to you this week is look at your cities, look at your lifestyle, do not make the same mistakes we've made in many of our cities in Europe. But the, the protests outside, and we saw them in Perth, we saw them in Auckland, um, and we're seeing them here today in Melbourne. I think it's just worth thinking a little bit about what these protests are. You see, it's perfectly right and legitimate in a free, democratic society that people should be able to express their view, and that includes dissent. I've been dissenting <laughs> in Brussels for nearly 20 years. But the problem, the objective, that many of these people out here have today is not to dissent in a democratic manner. It is not to present an alternative argument. No, what these people want to do is they actually want to close down debate. They actually want people like me not to be allowed to speak in these venues. Their actions are not just undemocratic, they are anti-democratic. And if you think about what those who went before us in two world wars, shed much blood for, it was for the right of us in a free democratic society to have our say, to debate, to listen to different point of views, and we must stop this attempt to close down free speech with every fibre in our ears. be committed Trotskyites, <laughs> committed to global revolution. No doubt mummy and daddy are paying all of their bills, but there we are. <laughs> and of course the committed Trots will hate me, because they see the European Union as being at the epicentre of the new globalist project. And don't be in any doubt. What the globalists want, the European Union, Hillary Clinton. Lock her up. Lock her up. Lock her up. I'll come back to Hillary later, I promise you. Lots more on Hillary to come. But what the globalists want, the European Union, Hillary Clinton, I dare say even the Malcolm Turnbulls of this world. Yes, it closed the money. <laughs> what they want is they, want, they don't want nation states to make democratic decisions. They want these decisions made at a higher authority, at a higher level. The Trotskyites want one world government, they want one world currency. Some of them out there protesting me today will be committed Trotskyites. And you know what? That's fine, because actually it's going nowhere. My guess, though, is many of those out there 
are protesting me. And I say this because I met one of you earlier on this evening, and you said to me, I told my sister, I was coming along to meet Nigel Farage tonight, and she said, well, why on earth would you go, go, want to go and listen to that horrible racist? And he asked her, have you ever listened to anything Nigel Farage has said? And she said, no, I don't want to listen to anything he's got to say. <laughs> and what you've got out there are a group of people who are being fed propaganda. Mm. They're being told that those of us that believe in the nation state, those of us that believe in proper border controls, those of us that are deeply skeptical of signing up to agreements like Paris, they're being taught that we're somehow neo-Nazis. Yes. And where is this going wrong? Well, I'll tell you. We used to teach in our schools and hospitals, our young people, something called critical thinking. Yes. And critical thinking is you say to young people, here's a problem, here are two potential solutions, and you make your mind up which of those you think is the right approach to the problem. Now we teach young people, here is a problem of climate change, migration, or national sovereignty, and here is one solution that is good and moral and strong and correct and you must believe in it because it's backed up by science. And here's another opinion which is evil, wrong and bad and should be closed down. I believe that what is going on in our universities in Britain, America, Europe, Australia and elsewhere across the Western world, I believe there is a cancer now deep within our university institutions. We are not teaching children in an unbiased ma manner on the matters of the day, and I want to see strong government that says, unless universities make sure that young people are exposed to both sides of the argument, all public funding stops. But there's a third reason why they're all out for first ward right around for weeks. <laughs> <laughs> There's a third reason why they're out there protesting, and it goes hand in glove with much of what's happening in our mainstream media. You know, you've only got to turn on and watch CNN. <laughs> it's 24-7, walls of war. Am I interrupting somebody? There'll be some protesters or something. Is that a protester? Boo! 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 Lock them up! Lock them up! Lock them up! Lock them up! You just wasted $90! Where's it coming from? Fire alarm. No, no, no. It's a lefty. It's a lefty. Get out there. I tell you what, folks, ignore it, let's carry on. Yes! Yes! yes. Now, if you look at CNN, it's wall to wall, 24 7 anti Trump propaganda. They're not behaving in any way like an objective media organisation, they're now behaving like they are the opposition to Donald Trump. We've also got problems with the BBC in my country. Better known as the Brussels Broadcasting Soros has wasted, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and I tell you what, I've told you what 
talk through louder barracking than that in the European Parliament over the years. So we can continue. So, it is, but it isn't just CNN, is it? It's the BBC, the Brussels Broadcasting Corporation, and dare I say it? Dare I say it? It's ABC in Australia! On ABC Radio, one of the questions was, you frequently seem to spend your time with neo-Nazis. <laughs> I said, name one. Well, moving on, he said. <laughs> I mean, listen, I'm big enough and ugly enough to pretty much take any question that any media commentator could ask me. But when something is slanted so much in the direction where the question is endlessly, when did you stop beating your wife? Is it any wonder, is it any wonder that so many of our misguided youth actually think that those of us that have vaguely conservative opinions are somehow bad and evil, but they're fighting and fighting. And the other level on which they're fighting, of course, is the great conspiracy theory, which is the, sorry? Russia. You got it, Russia. <laughs> I said it's some of this lot can't write it. They really are. It's Russia, isn't it? It's Russia, it's collusion. We now have the Mueller investigation in America, which is in day number 430, and they cannot prove any Russian collusion at all. It has reached, in my case, such ludicrous levels that Hillary, <laughs> but Hillary stands up and says that Nigel Farage is directly funded by the Russians. <laughs> oh yes. The Guardian newspaper says that I've been running memory sticks straight from the Oval Office from my friend the Donald. <laughs> But I've been running memory sticks straight from Donald to Julian Assange. <laughs> that somehow I am at the centre of this great global spider's web of a conspiracy. And I read all this stuff on the front pages. And I rang up a friend of mine in America. You probably haven't heard of him. A chap called Steve Bannon. Yeah. Yeah. And I rang up Steve and I said, Steve, have you seen what they're saying about me? They're saying, I have masterminded the Russian collusion in Brexit and in the American elections. Steve said, Nigel, don't tell them different. They think you're more important than you are. <laughs> now, I mean, I've never been to Russia. I've never done any business in Russia. I've never taken any money from Russia. I might have drunk a glass of vodka once. <laughs> so that's where we are. We have twisted media, we yes. have vicious political opposition, we have lies, just outright lies, being told on a scale that I don't think we've ever seen before. Do you know why the establishment and the globalists and the Goldman Sachses and the multinationals and the career political elites, do you know why they're being so vile and beastly to us? Because we are winning! Yeah. You know, I was never ever going to get involved in politics at all. I had no intention. I left school. I went to work in the metal trading business, the commodities business. I spent 20 years doing it. I got involved in politics because I could see that in my country and in many others, Politics have been taken over by careerists, people whose motivation was not to serve their country, to serve their community or their constituents. Their politics wasn't about personal conviction, it was about getting elected and getting re-elected. And what a narrow group of people they proved to be in my country, 
They all go to the same handful of schools. They all go to the same university. They all take the same degree. They all become political researchers. They all then become members of parliament aged 28 or 30. <laughs> None of them have any hobbies or hinterland outside of politics. They spend their weekdays together in London, their weekends together with each other in Oxfordshire. They marry each other's sisters. <laughs> <laughs> And they give us no political choice. And I could see that what was happening by stealth with this European project is they were giving away my birthright. Mm. They were giving away our ability as a free country to determine our own future. And I thought, the hell with this. I am going to fight these people. And that is exactly what I said. Yeah, man. party in British politics is not a very easy thing to do, um, and it was a long and at times very lonely road. But I never doubted for a moment that I was doing the right thing. I never doubted for a moment that at some point in time, that disconnect that exists between our capital cities and real people would be closed. And my opportunity came, my first real opportunity came in 1999 when the European elections were contested for the first time on the basis of proportional representation. It was the first time any national election had ever used this system. I wasn't necessarily at the time a fan of it, but I could see how useful it was. So I campaigned like crazy. I thought we could do it. And three of us from UKIP <coughs> got elected to the European Parliament. I found myself that night at 1.30 in the morning staring into a television camera, blinking, having never had any media training whatsoever, never done a live TV interview in my life, not quite sure really what to do. And the interviewer starts, he said, congratulations, Nigel, which is a clue, it wasn't the BBC. <laughs> he said, congratulations, Nigel, you've been elected, you said you would, but next week you'll go off on Eurostar to Brussels, you will get to your office, you will find a pile of invitations on your desk to lunches, dinners, champagne receptions. Do you, he asked me in my first ever live TV interview, do you think you'll become corrupted by the lifestyle? And I replied, and I still believe to this date it's the best reply I've ever given in a live interview, I replied, no, I've always lived like that. <laughs> so off I went to cause a bit of trouble and to have a bit of fun. And what I found over there, you know, I started off believing that the UK was a square peg in a round hole. I started off believing that because of our history, our alliances around the world, because of our common law system and many other things that we just were never ever going to fit the European political model. That the history of British exceptionalism had to come to the fore. You know, from Henry VIII onwards, we've always decided to do things our way and not their way. Yes. But I went there believing that if the rest of Europe wanted it, that was fine by me. That didn't last very long. I realised within a couple of years that the whole lawmaking system in this union is bought and paid for by the big corporate businesses. That the more you regulate, the more you control, the less you allow in any sector, men and women setting up their own companies to innovate and go in and compete. I realised within a couple of years that this project was far more than being just about trade and cooperation between neighbours. I learned that this project was actually, and without the consent of any of the people, to parcel all these different people up with their different histories, their different cultures, their different languages, their different wines, their different cheeses, and to parcel them all up 
into one new United States of Europe to militarize them, to give them a foreign policy, to give them a president, and to do all of these things without ever asking whether it's what people wanted. And I thought to myself, how on earth can Germany and Greece fit together in the same political union, rather like Damien's uh, thesis that he wrote 20 years ago. And so I decided, within a couple of years, that my mission was not just to fight for Britain to leave the European Union, my mission was to morph into a global revolutionary, because I want Europe to leave the European Union, because I love the individual countries of Europe. I've never, thought it, I've never thought about it that way before. But our politicians should. I've never thought that way before. I thought with the title MEP, with the position in the Parliament, the chance to speak, I thought I'd be able to reach out to a big audience on a regular basis, but it wasn't to be. Because in many ways, the big media organisations did their best to make sure that my message did not, on a regular basis, reach out to millions of people. And then, in terms of timing, I think I have an extraordinary piece of luck. It was called YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> and so suddenly, I was giving speeches in the European Parliament as the financial crisis began to hit. I said in one speech, if you look today at the bond spread between Greek and German bonds, you can see a major euro crisis is happening. Not, of course, that any one of you in this room would understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> a little example of how I was beginning to use YouTube to reach out to different communities. And then the big opportunity came, and it was that in 2010, after years of wrangling over a European constitution, which then became a Lisbon Treaty, we were told that Europe was going to have its first political president. We were told it would be a man of such authority <laughs> that he would stop the traffic in Washington and Beijing. Crikey, I thought. They must have somebody really big lined up. I mean, who knows? Maybe it's even Tony Blair. I wasn't sure. <laughs> I'm in the office one day in Brussels. My assistant Jamie runs it. He says, they picked the president. I said, who? 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 Who's it going to be? He said, Herman Van Rompuy. I said, what? I said, do you mean that Belgian geezer who was prime minister a couple of years ago? I mean, I worked in politics. I'd barely heard of this bloke, yet he was going to be the big cheese. He was going to be the man <laughs> that was going to turn the European Union into a global superpower. This was the man that I was convinced very <coughs> few people had heard of. And the day of his big inauguration came, and the media were there, and it was a big event. And in, I waited to see him. So I'd never seen him in the flesh before. And in shuffled <laughs> this scruffy, scrawny little bloke. He hadn't bothered to cut his hair. The suit was 40 years out of date. He was wearing a pair of £9.99 plastic injection moulded shoes. <laughs> and the bloke looked a shambles. When he got up to speak, and it was a 17-minute dirge. It was the dullest thing. It was dull as ditch water. It was awful. And I thought, this is just a joke. Well, then the other speakers got up, the leader of the Christian Democrats, to say what a great chap he was, and the socialists, a guy called Martin Schultz, who then went on to become perfectly preposterous, but anyway. And they all got up to say what a great guy he was. And the Liberal leader spoke and said it was a great moment for Europe and a great moment for the world. And then it was my turn to speak. <laughs> as, leader, as leader of the ragtag and bobtail Eurosceptics. 
little lunatic, eccentric political parties, some of whom are now on the verge of taking government in their own respective countries <laughs> in Europe. When you stand up to give a public speech, and it's something I know that many people are very scared of, very, very nervous. You know, people say, oh my goodness me, you know, my daughter's getting married next week, I've got to give a speech, my brother's best man next speech, I've got to you know, give a speech, I've been promoted in my company. A woman says, I've got to give a speech, and people are really scared, they're scared of standing up and speaking. I suppose it's not really a natural thing to do. You've got to be sort of extrovert maniac to enjoy it, I suppose, but there we are. <laughs> My advice to people when they stand up and give speeches is, for goodness sake, don't write down and read a speech. Because if you do, you're looking down there and the audience are there. So look at them, engage with them, have a couple of simple points in your mind, and if it isn't the family christening, and you get one or two things wrong, don't worry. You know, within 20 years they'll forgive you, something like that. <laughs> no, the point is when you're speaking at the family christening, don't worry, even if you go slightly wrong, because everybody in that room is on your side. Now, when I spoke in the European Parliament in Brussels that day, <laughs> absolutely no one was on my side. And of course, if I wasn't quite sure what I was going to say, one word that was seen to be out of place would of course be used and they'd hound me with it for goodness knows how long. But I knew roughly what I wanted to do. I wanted to say, no one knows who you are. You've not been elected. You've paid more than President Obama. You can't be removed. The whole thing is a farce. I don't know about run Europe. For the looks of you, I wouldn't let you run a bump. That was the... <laughs> that was the basic plan. Anyway, I got up and I said, Mr. President, I said we were told that when the new President of Europe was appointed, it would be a man who would stop the traffic in Washington and Beijing. And what we got was you. <laughs> I said, I don't wish to be rude, but <laughs> anybody ever tells you that, it means the opposite, doesn't it? <laughs> Dad, I don't want to be rude, but. Now, where the next bit came from, I still to this day do not know. I'd never heard the phrase before in my life. I hadn't planned it. I hadn't scripted it. It just kind of happened. I said, you have the charisma of a damp rag, of the appearance of a low brain bank clerk. And the question I will ask, the question we all ask is, who are you? I have never heard of you. <laughs> With this, a cacophony <laughs> struck up in the European Parliament of people shouting out, saying disgrace, boo, throwing paper balls. I mean, it was absolute mayhem in there and the President of the Parliament was intervening and asking me to shut up and sit down and I didn't know what to do. I thought I'd just ignore the buggers and keep going and get out. <laughs> so I kept on and I finished up by saying, maybe the reason, Mr. Van Rumboy, that you want to abolish nation states, take away national identity and the pride people have in where they come from is because you come from Belgium. <laughs> oh man, he has such a way of words. I'm not quite sure whether the Belgian joke crosses over in Australia. Um, Belgian folks is a completely insignificant little place in Northern Europe. If ever you've been there before, you may well have forgotten by now. And of course, it's the only place in the world where the pigeons fly upside down. I'll tell you why later in private. The... I mean, come on, name a famous Belgian. Tintin, they cry. Fictional character. Hercule Poirot I get over there. 
fictional character. And I reckon on that day the chances of Herman Van Rompuy becoming famous were pretty limited too. Though, as a result of my speech, his recognition rating in Germany doubled overnight. <laughs> He should have paid me as a PR guy, and I suppose in some ways I should feel sorry for him, because when you Google Herman Van Rompuy and his life, and you know he's been a bureaucrat and prime minister of that dumb called Belgium and various <laughs> things like that. But actually, when you Google this distinguished European politician's life, all you get is me of that stuff. <laughs> Anyway, I sat down thinking, yeah, that was all right. <laughs> Earned the money today, pretty good. Well, of course, speaker after speaker rose to condemn me because they were disgraceful I was. I'd behaved like an English football hooligan. <laughs> Terrible insult. And something must be done. Well, not surprising if the call came through before very long. Would I report at nine o'clock the next morning to the office of the President and Chair of the European Parliament. Well, of course, I was there, on parade, on time, nine o'clock, outside the office, and after my very chequered career at school, this was something I had been quite used to. <laughs> nine o'clock outside the headmaster's office. You know the drill, don't you? So there I was preparing, exercise book going down, <laughs> the back of the trousers, getting ready to get six of the best. Millennials, I'm sorry if this offends you. <laughs> if I hear sort of involuntary sobbing breaking out of the crowd, um, I'll know why. Um, we used to live in tougher days, and we did get one at school. I'm not sure, actually, it was all that bad. But anyway, here we are. So in I go, I'm ushered in, and sitting behind the desk with a grave face, is a man called Mr. Buzek, a former Polish Prime Minister, President of the European Parliament, and he beckons me to a seat. And my second major piece of advice for all of you tonight is if you're, in, if you're invited into an interview and coffee is not offered, <laughs> you're in for a bollocking, all right? <laughs> so I sat there, he looked at me, and he gravely intoned, Mr. Farage, I'm asking you to apologise. He said, I want you to apologise to the European Parliament for bringing it into disrepute. <laughs> now, of course, I should have just sat and done the really, shouldn't I? <laughs> but I said, well, you've been having a pretty good go at that yourselves over the last couple of years. <laughs> Not necessarily getting things off to the best of starts. He said, and second.